Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is the third part of our first lecture on descriptive statistics and Islamic approach. In this part, we consider the fundamental question of what is knowledge. It turns out that on the answer to this question, there is a radical difference between current Western position and the Islamic one. This is a huge topic which I'm going to suppress into a few points on a single slide. But basically, philosophical trends in the history of thought which define what is knowledge, what is science, these have a great impact on our daily lives, but we are completely unaware of this. Just like the fish which is swimming in the ocean doesn't know why there are billions of tons of plastics in the ocean. He has no, the fish has no idea that there was somebody called DuPont who invented plastics and that the search for profits by corporations spread an infinite amount of plastics into the globe and these were dumped in the oceans. All of this massive causal chain is completely outside the comprehension of the fish. In the same way, uh, knowledge was redefined in 1930s by logical positivism in uh, Western intellectual tradition. We don't know anything about these major philosophical trends, but they, they have affected how we think and the nature of education we receive. In particular, modern social sciences were built in the early 20th century according to the ideas of logical positivism. They don't go back uh, to antiquity as we think they do. Uh, logical positivism itself was rejected by the philosophers in the 1960s, but this news did not travel to the social scientists. It still hasn't reached them. And so the subjects of economics, econometrics, and statistics are still based on logical positivist foundations. These foundations are now known to be wrong, and it is necessary to replace them, but this has not been done. And we are all trained to be positivists without our knowledge. How are we trained to be positivists? This is because we receive an education and we are taught subjects like chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics, etc., etc., etc. All of these are taught along on the built on the assumption of positivism without ever discussing the philosophy. But what we learn in the schools, we automatically assume that this is knowledge. Whatever the school is teaching us, that is knowledge. And so this uh, assumption on which this syllabus, this curriculum was created, uh, we, don't, we, we absorb by indirect methods, by, by demonstration. We, are, we learn what is knowledge by learning what is what is the range of courses that are being taught in the university without ever actually discussing the issue of what is knowledge and what it might be otherwise. So it is necessary to go briefly into understanding what is logical positivism and what is this understanding of knowledge. So very, very briefly, knowledge is, according to logical positivists, is based on objective observations of external reality. These are called facts. Facts are very different from values. Values are subjective. Facts are objective. So in particular, my life experience, my sadness, my happiness, love, all of these things are not part of scientific knowledge. So this uh, idea about knowledge uh, comes from a misunderstanding of science. Logical positive is thought that science is based on observations and it is not based on the hidden reality which produces these observations. But actually, this is why logical positivism failed ultimately, because it turns out that science depends crucially on things like gravity and subatomic particles and lots of things which simply cannot be observed. So science is also built on unobservable realities. But nonetheless, even though this philosophy is wrong, it became very popular and widespread and widely accepted in the early 20th century, mainly because um, of the loss of faith in Christianity and the rejection of Christianity and therefore the rejection of everything that is unseen and unobservable. So because logical positivism was in harmony with this idea that 
we should not trust anything that is unobservable, it became widely accepted. Even though we are taught otherwise, we are when we study economics, we say it goes back to Aristotle and uh, Adam Smith. Actually, the current form of social science was created in early 20th century under the influence of positivism. And this is based on the exclusion of the heart, the soul, and morality from knowledge because these things are not scientific, these things are not observable. Now the reality, the truth is that our life experience, mine and yours, and that of all human beings is the most important source of knowledge. But my life experience is not scientific. If I know how to drive a car, this is not science. This is based on my own uh, personal subjective experience. So according to logical positivism, this is not knowledge. So the most important kind of knowledge was excluded from the realm of knowledge by logical positivism. And um, logical positivism consisted of tried to rebuild knowledge after excluding the heart of the human beings. Just for an illustration to explain what this means, uh, in economics, uh, we have something which is called preference. This is the feeling in my heart that I like, for example, uh, mangoes, and I like them better than apples, for example. So this is a feeling of the heart. Now, this is unobservable. What I feel about apples and mangoes cannot be seen by anybody else, and so it cannot be scientific. So what they did was they replaced this preference by choice. Uh, I uh, suppose somebody puts an, a mango and an apple in front of me and asks me to choose. Now the one I take from the two will be my choice, and that is observable. So in general, this whole... Um, idea of replacing unobservables by observable. This was the uh, fundamental uh, principle of logical positivism. The whole field of psychology was revolutionized by Skinner, who came up with the idea of man as a robot. He can be programmed by stimulus and response, by, by rewards and punishments. There is nothing inside us because uh, that logical positivism denies this. All we have is behavior. And so uh, the famous book of Skinner is called Beyond Freedom and Dignity. So this positivist idea had a massive impact on all social sciences throughout and, uh, and it distorted them heavily because the inner structure, our subjective characteristics of human beings were taken out of the picture. The Quran has this ayat that Allah is the friend of those who believe and he takes them out from darkness to light. And as for the disbelievers, they are taken from light to darkness. So actually, if we look at science and scientific knowledge, we can see that the Europeans have made tremendous progress in this field. They have um, rocket ships and computers and microbiology and um, quantum physics and so on huge amount of knowledge that they have gained. So it seems that they have gone from darkness to light. And it is true that when it comes to the external world, they have made tremendous progress. But at the same time, there is the internal world, the world inside us, my feelings, my heart, my spiritual progress. About these, they have become blind and they have lost knowledge on that front in the 20th century. When positivism came into effect, it banished knowledge of our internal states uh, as being outside the domain of science. And this has led them, uh, European societies, to darkness when it comes to uh, the inner nature of human beings. And this is manifested in the structure of society where individualism and hedonism is on the rise. More than 50% of children are born outside of marriage and they never experience the love of the mother mother and father and in a safe and secure household. So the society is a real mess because uh, the humanities, the social sciences have been built on the wrong foundations in uh, Western societies. Coming back from the big picture to the topic at hand, how does this uh, logical positivism manifest itself 
in statistics. So the standard statistical methodology is pictured in this diagram that there is some hidden reality which we don't know and then uh, the, it manifests itself by observable manifestation. So what's in my heart manifests itself in my behavior which can be seen and then this behavior can be quantified and measured. So if I act intelligently, I can try to measure my intelligence by using an IQ test and thereby get some numbers. And so the job of the statistician is to, uh, is to analyze the numbers. It is the job of the field expert to understand what is intelligence and, and to devise tests which can be used to measure this intelligence and to create the numbers for the statistician to use. Uh, this split between what is applied and theoretical, this is, uh, uh, and, and the idea that you can analyze the observable manifestations by themselves separately without taking into account the hidden reality, this is the impact of positivism. As opposed to this, Islam offers us an integrated an analysis we have to look at all of the things together. We have to look at the hidden reality, which is unobservable. Then we have to look at how it manifests itself in the observable. And we have to look at how this might be converted into numbers by measurements. But we can't look at the numbers by themselves. We have to look at all stages of this process in an Islamic analysis. This positivism has caused a huge amount of harm to the world and statistics is a large part of this harm. Uh, for example, it is widely believed today that you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So the uh, um, famous key performance indicators, you, you, you try to monitor how people are performing by attaching numbers to their performance and then um, uh, you try to um, motivate them by making them produce big numbers. So what has happened in practice is that we count the number of articles and people write a lot of shoddy articles and get them published to increase the count instead of working about the, worrying about the real thing, which is the quality of the articles, which cannot be measured. Um, in the Vietnam War, people trained on this model, <coughs> McNamara and uh, graduates of Yale Business School, they tried to run the war by numbers and they said, okay, we'll count the number of casualties and we will try to increase them. And they did not realize that these casualties are people. They used very uh, ruthless measures to try to increase casualties of the Vietnamese and they created a huge amount of hatred and uh, and um, united the hearts of the people against the Americans, which created the power, the energy uh, to drive out the Americans and defeat them in battle, even though they have massively more power. Similarly, uh, it is true that what if we try to ma ma manage by numbers, if we try to motivate people by saying, okay, we, I'm going to measure how many hours you spent in the office, then people will find ways to deceive us and they will not do the work that we do. So many people have, who have studied motivation have found that money motivation plays a very small and unimportant role in motivating us to work, except in situations where it is necessary for life and sort of survival. So what does this imply for Islamic methodology? Well, basically, uh, the key idea is that statistical theory cannot be studied in isolation from the real world. We have to look at how theory applies and any abstract concept can only be understood when we relate it to a real world concrete example. So in statistics, we have these measures mean, median and mode. Everybody studies them, but uh, nobody knows what it means to use the one instead of the other. And the differentiation can only be made when we have a real world example, and in some examples, one of these measures is good, in the others, uh, some other measure is good. But in order, to in order to decide, we have to know what is the purpose of the analysis. And there are many different real world purposes for which these analyses are used. 
uh, but uh, in statistics in ordinary methodology we don't study these and therefore students never understand what is going on so in this course we will try to overcome this defect so and to conclude this uh, lecture true knowledge enters the heart uh, if knowledge is of the external world it cannot enter the heart the only way uh, only way to make uh, knowledge of the external world relevant is by relating it to human lives and that involves taking our theories and putting them into practice once you start applying things to the real world then knowledge can be harmful it can hurt human lives or it can be irrelevant or it can be useful it can bring benefit once this knowledge is related to human experience then it can also relate to our experience and our heart and that is how we make uh, knowledge come alive for students by relating it to our lives and uh, in order to do this we must overcome the theory application barrier which is part of orthodox approach to statistics